Hey everyone, what's going on? It's Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture on the English Reformation. So, in the previous lecture, we talked about the creation of the Anglican Church under Henry VIII. Remember, he needed a divorce, okay? He was having trouble producing a male heir. So, in order to get that divorce, he is going to create his own church, aka the Anglican Church, aka the Church of England, all right? Now, eventually, Henry VIII is going to die. And we are going to talk kind of today about the rest of the Tudors and how they navigate. Um, you know, the Anglican Church, what they do with the Anglican Church, okay? And then we're going to end talking about the last tutor, Elizabeth, and some of her main uh, accomplishments with the Ang Anglican Church and some of her accomplishments when it comes to foreign policy, okay? So let's quickly talk about the rest of the tutors, all right? Remember, Henry VIII needed a male heir. Well, eventually he did get that male heir, and that is Edward VI, all right? Edward VI, he's going to take over when he's about nine years old, all right? Um, and what's important to remember about Edward VI, ladies and gentlemen, is what he does during his reign to the Anglican Church. He makes it Protestant, okay? That's very different from what Henry VIII does with the Anglican Church. If we remember, right, Henry VIII was very much a believer in Catholicism. Well, we can't say, you know, he was like, you know, you know, a true believer in Catholicism because he renounces Catholicism and makes his own uh, church. But if we remember, Henry VIII, uh, you know, was very faithful to uh, Catholic practices, okay, until he gets his divorce, all right? So Henry VIII in Henry VIII's England church had a lot of elements of Catholicism in it, and he was very much an opponent of uh, Protestantism. Remember, he, 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 um, he was very much against Martin Luther, okay? Edward VI does something different. Edward VI is going to go a completely other way, and he is going to introduce a lot of Protestantism to the Anglican Church, okay, and that's different. He's going to um, impose the Book of Common Prayer. He's going to uh, allow clergy to marry, which is a Protestant belief. He's going to take out Catholic altars and images from churches, introduce many uh, Protestant doctrines, such as faith alone, believing in two sacraments, okay? So it's important for us, and what I'm trying to get at right here, ladies and gentlemen, it's important to kind of see the evolution of the Anglican Church under the Tudors, okay, and the different Tudor leaders, all right? So that's the Protestant church under Edward VI. He's going to die at a pretty young age, all right? And after him, okay, we see Mary I come to power. Well, Mary I is going to do the exact opposite of what Edward did, okay? She is going to bring the church back to Catholicism, all right? She is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and Henry. That was uh, uh, Henry's first wife, okay? She's the granddaughter of um, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, and we know that they are very very Catholic. Those were very Catholic rulers. Uh, and she's also married to Philip II, the heir of Spain. So she is very much a believer in Catholicism. She has a strong Catholic background in her family. Okay. And so she is going to really try to bring Catholicism back to England. All right. Um, she is not going to tolerate um, uh, many Protestants. Okay. And she's actually going to kill uh, and, and this is where she earns the nickname Bloody Mary, okay? She's actually going to kill uh, around 300 Protestants, okay? Um, and really make an enemy of uh, Protestants in England. And what we're seeing here, kind of what Mary I does with her, with her policies, and she's really going she's really gonna alienate uh, uh, the Protestants in England. Remember, Ed, Edward VI has introduced and allowed Protestantism to thrive in England. And so there's going to be a following of Protestantism in England. You know, with her, you know, killing them and, and really trying to reverse course, that's going to upset the Protestants in England. And when Mary dies, okay, and Elizabeth takes over, Elizabeth has a really big problem on her hands. And that is that, you know, there is this religious question of, of what is England's, you know, religious doctrine going to be officially because is it going to be Catholic or Protestant? And, and Elizabeth, we're going to see Elizabeth really have to uh, uh, be careful um, in defining the Anglican Church because a civil war could break out over religion, okay? So Mary, she's going to die, and we're going to see Elizabeth I take over um, after Mary, okay? And here is a picture of Mary called Bloody Mary for what she did to Protestants. Okay, let's talk about Elizabeth I first. First, she is super important, ladies and gentlemen. We really need to know Elizabeth for the AP exam. She will show up some way, some form. She's very important, okay? Uh, she was called the Virgin Queen because she was unmarried and she does not have an heir. 
okay? Uh, she did not have an heir, and we're going to see after Elizabeth I, the, uh, the, uh, the Stuart family take over, okay? She's considered the most outstanding monarch in English history, um, and was the last, uh, she is the last tutor. She was a Renaissance supporter, very self-confident. She was incredible, okay? And it, what's unique about Elizabeth, ladies and gentlemen, is that she was not only very successful when it came to her domestic policy in England, but she was also very successful when it came to her foreign policy in England. And we're going to be talking about all those, um, all of those uh, uh, actions that she takes. Okay, um, she's about twenty-five years old when she takes over. Um, uh, England is having a conflict with France and with Scotland. There's uh, the economy is suffering. Uh, there's religious uh, divisions. In uh, the eyes of some people, she is an illegitimate queen, okay? Um, and uh, so Elizabeth has a lot to deal with right when she uh, takes the throne, okay? Um, and also something I want you all to know about Elizabeth is that she was a very strong Protestant, okay? She held strong Protestant beliefs. That's going to be important for us, ladies and gentlemen, to understand um, in kind of what she does with the, uh, the religious policy of, um, of England, okay? So... This is important, ladies and gentlemen, and this is where I really want people to pay attention when it comes to Elizabeth, okay, is that she is going to fix the church, okay? She understands that if she makes the church really Protestant or really Catholic, okay, one group in England is going to be upset, okay? So here's what she does, all right, is she is going to recreate the Anglican church in a moderate form, aka, all right? She is going to kind of allow this church and mix in some uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. Okay, she's going she's gonna to kind of mix, mix in both to appease both groups. Also, ladies and gentlemen, she is going to allow people in private to practice what they want. Okay, and this is important. And, and, and this illustrates that, uh, this notion that she is a politique or a practical ruler. She is going to put England and what's best for England Okay, first, as opposed to her own personal beliefs. Remember, she's personally a Protestant, but she is not going to, you know, fully, you know, make England a Protestant country and, ma and make England, the, the Church of England, a Protestant country because she knows that if she does that, if she, even though that's what she believes, civil war could break out. So she's going to kind of create this moderate form of Protestantism, okay, and this really... Um, this really inclusive form of Protestantism into England, all right? And what she is doing is she's, you know, carefully navigating this middle ground between Catholicism and Protestantism so both sides are, uh, you know, appeased or okay with, or okay with the church, okay? And she's also going to uh, deal uh, very carefully with the extreme groups, the extreme Protestants, a.k.a. the Puritans, and the extreme Catholics, okay? And these two groups were very are going to be very angry, angry with her because she's not making the church Protestant- you know, solely Protestant or Catholic, okay? but And she's going to deal very carefully with them, okay? All right, let's move on, okay? So what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is her Elizabethan settlement, and that is kind of what I just described before, this moderate Anglican church where she takes the middle ground, where she sprinkles in some elements of Catholicism and Protestantism, okay? And one of the uh, things that she does is she issues this um, act of uniformity. She's going to require people to conform to the Anglican Church, this moderate Anglican Church. But as I said before, in effect, okay, she's going to allow people, okay, to privately practice what they want. That's going to make a lot of people happy, okay? That she's not necessarily forcing people, okay, to completely abandon their religion. Now they may have to go to the Anglican Church and be uncomfortable with some of the services if they're a Protestant or a Catholic, because we know that there's a mixture of both in there. But when they go home, they can kind of practice what they want to practice, okay? So she's being very inclusive here. She's trying to include as many people as possible um, into her religious doctrine, okay? And she's trying to uh, she's trying to help everyone kind of, um, you know, feel comfortable um, with, you know, the religion in England, okay? And like I said, she's going to make this, her Anglican church, a mixture of Protestantism and Catholicism, uh, of Catholicism, all right? Um, some church services are going to resemble Catholic practices, there's going to be, you know, the clergy members are going to have traditional Catholic wear. It's very fancy and ornate, um, you know, very, very uh, complex, all right? Um, uh, traditional Catholic images are going to be allowed in, uh, in, in the church. However, there are some Protestant elements, right? Services are in English. There's no transubstantiation. The clergy are allowed to marry. 
There's only two sacraments, okay? So this shows, ladies and gentlemen, how she's really trying to make both Catholics and Protestants uh, comfortable with her Anglican church. And this is what makes her a politique. She, you know, she is Protestant. Okay? She does not follow Catholicism, but she is allowing Catholicism into the Anglican church so the Catholics will feel comfortable with this and that will kind of calm tensions down. This is brilliant, very successful. And because of this, ladies and gentlemen, she's going to avoid, you know, a massive uprising, a massive civil war. Okay, eventually we're going to see uh, England go into a civil war. That'll be with the Stuarts, but not necessarily, and not under Elizabeth's watch. Okay, no, she's going to she's going to solve this problem and really put her country and its well-being um, before herself. And that's what makes her a politique, a practical ruler. Okay, very practical. Okay. Um, she's going to, uh, with this 1559 Act of Supremacy, declare herself the supreme governor of the realm and the Anglican Church. She doesn't outright call herself the king uh, or the queen, okay, monarch. She calls herself more of like a servant to the realm, and that really brings a lot of support um, to her, all right? Um, and, 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 you know, by not declaring herself ruler, okay, she didn't upset necessarily the men, uh, who wouldn't like being ruled by a woman, okay, nor the Catholics, okay, who thought that the Pope was their ruler, all right, so she is very, she is a very smart, smart leader, she knows exactly, uh, uh, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the context, the situation of what's going on in England, she has a pulse on the political situation, the religious situations um, in, in England, and she, she is, she, she understands the gender norms very well, Okay, and so she is really maintaining her power and showcasing her authority in very careful ways. Okay, um, one of the important texts under her uh, reign that's really important that's, that's going to help define her uh, um, her moderate Anglican Church is this uh, this thirty nine articles, and that's where she really puts forth a lot of the beliefs that I've kind of already mentioned um, that the the new this new kind of you know Church of England Anglican Church is going to stand for that moderate. Um, that moderate uh, doctrine, okay, that followed the Protestant doctrine, that had, you know, Catholic-y Catholic practice, excuse me, um, and it was vague enough to accommodate most Christians, okay, except Puritans, okay, the, the Puritans are going to be really upset with Elizabeth because her church can th contains Catholicism, but we, we know that for the majority of people in England, they're, they're not going to be, you know, they're, it's not going to be too much of a big deal for them because they're going to be able to practice whatever they want when they go home. Okay, but the Puritans, but there are going to be Puritans who are really, really upset with Elizabeth um, uh, and upset with um, the church having any notion of Catholicism. And we're going to get into Puritans when we talk about the Stuarts in the next chapter, okay? Um, Elizabeth will tol tolerate some of the more moderate Puritans, but not the extremists, okay? And again, we're going to, we're going to discuss Puritans um, and kind of the, some of their, their different beliefs and different ideologies and different kinds of Puritans in the next chapter, Okay. Um, she's also not going to tolerate extreme devout Catholics, okay? And uh, I'm going to get into this conflict that she has with her cousin, uh, Mary, the Queen, uh, Queen, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, and kind of what goes down with that, okay? So let's talk about um, Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots, okay? Mary, Queen of Scots, um, she was a ruler um, in Scotland, which is north, okay? Um, and she was forced out of Scotland, and she was forced to go to England, okay? And Mary, Queen of Scots, um, she was married to a French monarch, okay? And she was Catholic, all right? Well, all right, um, she was Catholic, and everyone knew that since Elizabeth did not have, a, you know, a child or an heir, that Mary Queen of Scots, her cousin, was next in line. Well, Mary Queen of Scots is going to kind of mess up a little bit, all right? Um, and, you know, uh, uh, she's going to, you know, Mary Queen of Scots is going to plot to kill Elizabeth, and she kind of underestimated Elizabeth's support and Elizabeth's power, okay? Uh, and so uh, Elizabeth is going to uh, find out that her cousin is... Um, you know, trying to kill her, and Elizabeth's going to have her executed. Also, Mary Queen of Scots, you know, even if she had kind of tried to start, you know, like an uprising or anything against Elizabeth, she wouldn't really have a lot of support because uh, a lot of uh, people did not want to go back to being a purely Catholic nation. The Catholics, for sure, wanted uh, uh, would have uh, supported her, um, but by this time, many people have really bought into this moderate form of... Um, uh, the Anglican Church that's kind of mixing in elements of Protestantism and Catholicism. Um, and Elizabeth also had a lot of uh, support from the people. Okay, so she is going to, um, Elizabeth is going to kill her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. Okay, now here's something really important, ladies and gentlemen, for us to understand, okay? Elizabeth and her foreign policy, all right? 
At the same time this is all going on, th these domestic issues, there's also an issue of Spain, okay? Um, and we're going to see the famous Spanish Armada, all right? This, this um, Philip II, who is the ruler of Spain at this time, was very upset with Elizabeth because Elizabeth did not want to marry, uh, marry him. Also, uh, 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 Philip II is uh, kind of, uh, he, there's a war going on in the Netherlands. Ne the Netherlands are revolting from the Spanish. The, the uh, um, Spanish owned the Netherlands at this time. And Elizabeth is giving um, money and supplies and supporting uh, the, uh, the, the, the Protestants, the, uh, the Calvinists fighting, uh, who are fighting the Spanish. And he does not like that. Um, we also, during this time, have um, uh, English, uh, uh, some of the English Navy kind of pirating the Spanish Navy and, um, you know, taking their ships and taking some of their um, goods uh, on, the, uh, on the ocean, uh, you know, on the trade routes. Um, and also, it's just this big idea of a Catholic country versus a Protestant country. So we see the great Spanish Armada, this huge navy um, uh, Philip decides to invade uh, England with uh, in 1588. And we are going to see uh, the English just completely destroy uh, the Spanish Armada. The English will not even lose a ship, one single boat. And what what's important about this, ladies and gentlemen, is that England now has the number one navy in the world, okay? Uh, and this is going to increase pride in England. It's going to uh, really elevate Elizabeth to this just incredible power, the status in, um, in Europe and the world, um, and really start to facilitate uh, England's transition into a global world power, okay? And what's important about this, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're going to see England and this this number one navy, you know, dominate up until 1945. It, and this is a really important uh, idea for us to understand when it comes to the English uh, and their navy is that they are going to dominate the ocean, okay, until World War II. And that is that is really important. England is going to have the most powerful navy. We're going to see that when it comes to Napoleon. Uh, we're going to see that when it comes to colonization, and we're going to see that. Uh, in uh, you know World War One and World War Two, the English Navy really really important. Okay, this is an embarrassing loss for Philip. Okay, in Spain, but also an embarrassing loss for Catholics. Okay, and a big victory for Protestants all over. Protestants all over Europe are going to be celebrating this victory. Okay, uh, the Protestant country of England defeating the Catholic country of Spain. Okay. All right. Culturally, during uh, Elizabeth's reign, okay, we're going to see Shakespeare. Okay, a lot of literary uh, development, okay? There's going to be uh, exploration. You're going to see uh, famous explorers like Sir Francis Drake, Sir Walter Raleigh, okay? Um, but important for us to understand, okay, that uh, Elizabeth ne never married, and she did that on purpose, okay? She did that uh, as a way to give herself a, a political um, advantage. You know, she always had it out there, especially in her youth, that, you know, she was unmarried, and that by might be a way for her to kind of get along better with other countries in the hopes that they that they might be able to have like a claim to the English throne if, if you know Elizabeth got married to a, a male heir from a certain country okay uh, but she never married she never had any children she lived until she was about 70 years old okay and on her death um, her, her deathbed uh, King James the sixth he'll be known as James the first of England is going to be named her successor and this is actually Mary Queen of Scots son um, which we're going to talk about but James um, he was not the sharpest tool in the shed, and he's really going to cause some problems. And we're going to see James. He's a, he's part of the Stuart family. Um, after Elizabeth, we're going to see James and Charles and the Stuarts. Um, you know, uh, you know, make some mistakes, and eventually, um, we're going to see the, uh, the 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 English Civil War. Okay, let's talk about Elizabeth's accomplishments. Okay, she was practical. Okay, with the Catholics and Protestants, she kept her country religiously. Um, united, okay, which is really, really important. She did not let this this uh, a civil war break out between Catholics and Protestants by creating that Elizabethan settlement, okay, by by having that moderate uh, Anglican church. She really settled things down, okay. During her reign, uh, uh, we're going to see this kind of golden age for England, it, the, uh, culturally, uh, on a foreign policy level, okay, on a domestic level. England really emerged as one of the world's great nations and definitely as a world power, okay? With the defeat of the Spanish Armada, England is going to be ruling the oceans. And if you rule the oceans, okay, you are going to have a tremendous amount of power and England is going to rule the oceans, okay? All right, that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. I'm going to post this lecture and then in the next lecture, I'm going to continue talking about um, the Reformation on the continent. 
in, um, in Europe. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Take care.